I, <laughs> am I on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome. Should we wait a couple minutes? Sure. Yeah. Uh, for to let people come through, maybe one or two minutes. Thanks for all of you who are here on time. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> It's an elevator music. Yeah, I know, right? Some BMG. BMG? BGM? BGM. BGM. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, you can look that up, right? We're here at Umami Mart right now, actually. So this is our bar. Welcome. We'll open soon. And uh I know I'm very, very excited for this to be open. Yeah, we have some cool bottles. Uh, if you see back here, we have some very, I don't know if you can actually see that, but we've got some extremely rare Ichido Chichibu bottles. Um, so we've got the Zodiac, um, the, Mount, the Year of the Rat, and the Year of the um, Wild Boar, which is very exciting. Um, yeah, so anyway, that'll be very exciting to, once we open the bar and we can uh, taste those bottles. Have you tasted that? Uh, a few of them, yeah. Um, I haven't had the Zodiac ones, but I've had, had a little bit of uh, Scooby, the first 10, and then a pretty old version of On The Way that we used to carry at the shop. Um, and then the rest of it is, you know, they're, they're a little bit elusive. So uh, the Ichiro's Molten Grain Limited Edition is still one of my favorite things. I think you guys have on the shelf. It's yeah. delicious. I just saw on Instagram that Chichibu collaborated with somebody in England. I don't know if it's like a British liquor shop, hmm. but something just came out. I mean, that's a limited bottle with them. Yeah, they still, I mean, I'm not sure if it's the same thing, but they do like the US edition. They have like, they have exclusive editions of that that go okay. globally and definitely like once in that market. But, you know, the thing everyone is kind of getting pumped about and excited about for when it gets released is going to be their collaboration with um, Martian Shoe. And those oh, whiskeys because yeah. they oh, okay. basically did they swap and they make and then age them in their various facilities so be pretty that exciting. exciting yeah it was it's already released in japan and i'm not sure how much got released there but i know it's gonna they're gonna go fast out here for sure it's gonna come out here yeah well i think okay. don't quote me on that well that's i'm glad that they're collaborating with each other yeah it's awesome it's just nice to kind of like it's nice to see you know, obviously two very, very prominent distilleries actually just like kind of the rising tide brings up old chips and especially with Japanese whiskey, instead of it being this kind of like small, you know, small cadre of people that are kind of like trying to see who can outsell each other, which doesn't happen so often with distilleries. It's really nice that people are collaborative and especially in Japan, so people are doing it for like the love of making whiskey. Um, All right, let's, let's, let's get started here. Hi, I'm Kayoko. I'm uh, the co-founder of Umami Mart with Yoko, who's actually here working the uh, video for us today. Um, a couple of things before we start. Um, uh, we're working on getting our bar open for all you local folks. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, very exciting news is that we now have our spirits license here behind the bar. So that means, you know, we'll be able to serve whiskeys and gins, of course, make highballs for you. So that's uh, super exciting. We're working on kind of opening back up slowly in the next month or so. So stay tuned for that. Um, we're celebrating nine years of Umami Mart in August, um, which is unbelievable in Oakland, California. Uh, so make sure that you get our email newsletter because that's where we announce it first and we kind of do a sneak peek for all the email newsletter people the night before and it's our blowout of the year sale anniversary sale um that we do and uh everything kind of sells out so make sure that you're on our email news newsletter um so you get sneak peek on that 
Um, we have another spirits event next week where we have uh, multiple events, which is very fun. Next week is Awamori Bazaar um, featuring uh, Awamori ambassador, Nick Korn, and he's Boston based and he'll be joining us. Um, very exciting. If you wanna learn more about Japan's indigenous spirit from Okinawa, uh, very, um, it's gonna be really educational. Nick will also be making some cocktails. Um, so that's gonna be a lot of fun. Tune in next Wednesday the 21st um, and explore the alamodis that we have online or in our, in our shop. We have several really excellent bottles. Um, we're so happy to have Chris Lane here, the myth, the legend. Um, if you live locally, I'm sure you know Chris. He's definitely our favorite bartender here in the Bay Area. We've known him for years um, since his days at La Linda, which is in San Francisco. And then we were lucky to get him over here in the East Bay uh, where he was the bar manager at Ramen Shop for several years. Um, today, he is the spirit specialist for Skernick Wines West. Um, and we'll be featuring two of the bottles today, um, the gins today that are distributed through Skernick. So very lucky to have Chris, super knowledgeable on all spirits, especially Japanese spirits. Um, so he's constantly coming in here and educating us on um, Japanese whiskeys and gins. And we get to uh, tell him a little bit about shochis. Yeah, just <laughs> always fun to learn about that stuff. <laughs> um, but before uh, I hand it over to Chris, I thought it'd be fun to talk a little bit about the history of gin, um, just to touch on a couple of points uh, to give um, some context. But before that, let me just say that um, always put your chats in uh, to the chat or your questions into the chat. Um, I'll be moderating after I'm done here um, and uh, Yoko's on it now. So she'll be dropping in links and things. So make sure to just uh, holler at us um, or feel free to say anything. This is very casual. So go ahead and shout out any questions you might have for me or for Chris. Okay, so history of gin. Um, the precursor of gin is Geneva from the Netherlands. Um, and that was uh, discovered around 16th century. Um, and then it was just, and then the British discovered it, shortened the word to gin. And um, King William of Orange legalized home gin distilling in late in the late 1600s. And because people were distilling all sorts of nasty stuff, it really made people crazy. And it really you know, killed a lot of people. There were a lot of deaths, a lot of um, diseases, people, you know, mothers and fathers going crazy and like accidentally killing their children. Um, and, you know, this is funny because actually gin really is the alcohol that makes me crazy. <laughs> and I, that, you know, my friend can tell you, you know, there was like a night where we got really drunk, a drunken night on gin and I like beat him up. So, you know, it makes it definitely like makes me really violent. And even last night um, I was, you know, to, to, to prepare myself for this event tonight, I started drinking, sipping on some of these gins and I got pretty drunk really fast. So you gotta beware when drinking gin. Um, but of course, um, things <laughs> improved in, if things improved in the 1800s, uh, when the production still, uh, called the coffee still was invented by an Irishman coffee that's C O F F E Y, the name of, of the, of the guy who invented the coffee still. Um, and then from there, London dry gin was invented, which was a style of gin that is, uh, the most popular in the world today. Um, and I don't know, maybe Chris can touch on why that is or, or what, what, what makes it so. I mean, I think it's a lot of it is just, you know, you're talking about a flavor profile that, um, that's pretty iconic because mostly like the thing, if you're talking about like a London dry style of gin, you're really talking about a gin that doesn't have any real like heavy duty designation on it other than Juniper is kind of the star of the show. So that's that flavor hook that people just kind of like recognized. It was something that widely spread with the use of the gin and tonic. 
and it's just that thing that kind of people will always call back to in terms of like what a gin is and that obviously has splintered out into a lot of different styles but most of them even new styles especially ones that we're talking about from japan will reference london dry in some way shape or form and that's really just saying like this is a gin this has juniper in it mm, okay i mean i myself definitely prefer like a beef just a basic beef feeder Classic. or um plymouth yeah you know um also very economical yeah, totally. you know um so they tend to be kind of the the um lower shelf with gins that are just very delicious they're also just classics yeah you know can't beat a classic they're really good i actually went to um house of prime for the first nice. time two weeks ago i cannot and, get a reservation there uh and actually like that's just what you do. You just have a beef eater martini and it's great. Yeah. So that was like the perfect thing to get with that. Right. And I feel like a lot of the newer boutique gins tend to be so juniper heavy. Yeah, that, um, you know, I do I do kind of prefer those just kind of the basic classic gins. Um, okay, but I cannot take credit for um, these notes that I just mentioned about the history of gin. Um, I highly recommend you all listen to the Japan Distilled podcast that just dropped about Japanese gin, and um, Yoko is going to drop that in right now. Um, it is extremely educational. I mean, I obviously learned a lot about gin, and I also learned a lot about Japanese gins. Uh, Stephen Lyman, I think, is tonight here live from Japan. Um, he is a co-host of Japan Distilled podcast, and I'm really excited that he's been able to make it uh, tonight with us. Um, he's the author of the James Beard, um, uh, James Beard nominated book, The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, um, and based in Fukuoka, Japan. So um, thanks, Stephen, for joining us. And after um, Kayoko had talked about her gin um, episode, Stephen says, in that case, we are definitely not drinking gin when I come to Oakland. <laughs> yeah. And he has a Yamato Zakura apron on Chris. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Stevens a shochu and awamori specialist, and uh, we couldn't recommend the Japan uh, Distilled podcast more. I've listened to all of the episodes, um, talking any. They have a great four part series on Japanese whiskey that I also recommend everybody uh, listens to. And I also just listened to their Kokuto shochu special that was also very enlightening. So if you're interested in shochu at all, definitely go over there. Um, he and his co-host Christopher Pellegrini um, are both really unpretentious and funny and like just really easy to listen to. So um, definitely uh, tune in there. And I was hoping that Stephen would be able to kind of enlighten us a little bit about what's going on in Japan since he's over there um, and drinking a lot of the just Japanese gins about what's going on in Japan and the gin scene. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you uh, for your kind words about the podcast. It's still pretty early here in Japan, so I apologize if I'm not as energetic as I might be other times, but um, enjoying my first cup of coffee of the day. But uh, yeah, Japanese gin really is, um, it's taking off. You've got all kinds of brands appearing. A lot of the shochu makers are getting into the gin game, realizing that that's a Western spirit that, that they may be able to wrap their heads around. And it's early days. People are really experimenting a lot. And, uh, and it's really all, I don't want to, sort of uh, steal your thunder, but it really all began with Kenobi, um, which I'm sure you'll talk much more about uh, during your presentation. Uh, and it, it, that was only released in 2016. So we're talking in the last five years, gin's gone from zero to 100. It's really been an incredible rise in Japanese gin. And they have a very distinctive style, uh, uh, an, exp an expression that you really don't find in a lot of other gins around the world. So it should be fun for people to explore. Is that enough? Fantastic. Yeah, that's, I, I thought that that point in your uh, podcast was definitely the most enlightening where, yeah, five years ago, nobody was really talking about it. Then Kenobi came out. Then, you know, I think you mentioned that Centauri bought Sip Smith and learned how to make Japanese gin. They come out with Roku. Nika comes out with their gin. Well, and I, which I actually think that the uh, Nika is a, super, is a superior gin, uh, very good. This is the Roku. Roku we sell a lot of because um, of the value. It, it's, a, it's a good economical price. Um, 
Yeah, if I can comment on that, the I think it's so representative of the DNA of those two companies. I mean, Suntory is the largest spirits maker in the world now because they they bought Jim Beam, so they're just a massive company. So their solution to to making a gin was to buy Sip Smith Distillery to learn how to make gin, where Nika was very considered. They had their coffee still. They had their coffee malt whiskey. They're like, all right, well, we're going to use that still to make a gin. And the bottle, the packaging is unpretentious. It's just, it's very classic Nika. And I think, uh, and the quality of the product reflects that. And that's really how I think about Nika is they, they're very considered in, in how they make their products, even though they are a very large company where Suntory is very much about packaging and branding. And, you know, the Ro Roku bottle is beautiful. It's got the six sides and Roku means six. It's got six botanicals. There's all these stories that can easily be told with the package and the brand itself. Um, but, and that if you, if you know the history between those two companies, it's also very much the same thing. Uh, the founder of, of Suntory wanted his distillery close to Tokyo and Osaka because that's where the markets were. That's where he could sell his whiskey easy, most easily. And uh, the founder of Nika, Masataka Taketsuda, was living, was working for him and he opened the Yamazaki distillery with him, but they had a falling out because Taketsuda really thought the best place to make Japanese whiskey was in Hokkaido, but that was a two-day trip away from anywhere at that time. So it, it, that just, you see that one of them was really thinking about the monetary side of it and the other one was thinking about the quality side. And I think that still exists today between those two companies. That's not to say, take anything away from Suntory. They offer great value, as you said. Um, but Nika, always, whenever I think about those two companies, I think about Nika as the one that's more focused on the quality of the drink and Suntory more focused on the story and, and, and uh, the branding. So, sorry, that went on a little too long. And um, just uh, before I hand it over to Chris, I also did want to... Um, comment that this uh, yuzu gin is, I've been drinking this as well. It's quite delicious. And um, I love it. It's a sweet potato shochu base. And they are well known in Japan to make sweet potato shochu. And so um, anybody out there who wants to try different gins, uh, these are all available on our website and our shop. Um, but Chris today, he's here talking about uh, Kinobi and um, which is a very uh, prestigious um, gin company at this point, um, as well as a Komasa um, distillery that just, um, which is a very new distillery making whiskey and gin now. So I will hand it over to Chris now. We're still Welcome. talking about your violent gin episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says, how violent does that gin make you? <laughs> Um, that's, I mean, my friend Matt will completely, uh, he still talks about that night. I don't really know. I think I blacked out, but Do we yeah, kind of like rate this by black eyes and broken noses <laughs> yes. or broken yeah, lips? No, like, no, it wasn't I kind of like that. that. It wasn't like that, but feelings were hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'll be uh, moderating the chat, so hand over some questions. Wow. On that note, um, who's ready to drink some gin and get in a fight? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my name's Chris. Uh, I work for Sternic Wine and Spirits on the West Coast. Um, I'm the spirit specialist for Northern California. And I really just wanted to quickly thank um, Kayoko and Yoko for inviting me here to be a part of this. Um, we've just did the math and realized that we've been friends for almost a decade, which is kind of crazy that time has gone on that long. But it's always been great to, be, to collaborate with them and have an opportunity to come back and talk to you guys. So, thanks for having me. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple gins and then make some cocktails with them because that's kind of usually what, what my line is to come in and talk about stuff is because just spending all the years behind the bar you know, to talk about how to mix with these spirits. Um, both of these gins do something that I think is very, very important when you're talking about well-made spirits, and that is that they very distinctly are of a place. Um, so when you're talking about the Kinobi from the Kyoto Distillery, they started with the idea of doing something that was going to be distinctly Japanese in terms of the botanicals that they were using. And just like it was mentioned earlier, these guys released this product in 2016. And since then, this kind of you know, wave of new Japanese gyms have come out. You see a lot of them on the shelf right now. But 
you know, not to give them credit as saying they were the first, but definitely they were taking this idea of regional local ingredients and putting that as their thumbprint on a gin. So um, they hired a really, really young distiller from uh, the UK named Alex Davies, um, who really like, really, really kind of like jumped on like full steam ahead and really wanted to rock with these ingredients and didn't know a whole lot about them. So a majority of the ingredients that are in here, there are 11 botanicals. Um, juniper is going to be chiefly amongst them because you gotta have juniper in order for it to be a gin. There's lemon, yuzu, there's a little bit of bamboo leaf, red shiso, ginger, um, orris root, which is basically like, um, it's iris roots, basically. Um, as well as hinoki, so Japanese cypress. And then, uh, what's the last one I'm missing? It is sancho, it's green sancho peppers. So that really kind of like uh, bright citrusy pepper that you're, you get in like yusukosho, things like that. So um, he is approaching those botanicals much like you would approach uh, components of a perfume, which is actually, to my understanding, that's kind of something he's always wanted to do, is be a perfume maker. And in order to do that, you really have to have a good understanding of what your ingredients are and how they behave with one another. So for Kinobi, um, and actually as well as the Kamasa, they kind of take the long road around making gin and they take those 11 botanicals and they divide them into six separate sections and they distill those individually rather than getting a big basket of botanicals, like taking all those 11 ingredients and putting them in the still and doing a pass through it, they will make separate spirits and then blend them after the fact. Um, a big reason for doing that is it allows you to have a lot of control over your ingredients. It does take a lot more time, but it also, and it's not exactly the most cost-effective thing ever, but what you can do is you can really kind of amplify or dial back on ingredients that might seasonally be different from one another. So another ingredient that they have in this is tea. It's a green tea called Gyokuro. Did I get the pronunciation mm -hmm. right on that? Yeah, Gyokuro. Always, yeah. always like worried I'm gonna just totally blow that. Uh, or just break stuff that's below me. It's cool. <laughs> Used to it, that's happens in bars. Welcome to your new bar, guys. Uh, so anyways, that's really kind of like the idea. So they're taking these six different categories, they're blending them after the fact. And they're coming out with this incredibly balanced gin that is of a place. Um, to me, it smells like Japan. It smells like the things that I kind of identify with a lot of like the food, the surrounding air, the kind of the way it, it tastes. I think a lot of it actually has to do with the water. Um, they're getting their water from uh, the Fushimi River. And so they actually, they're sourcing their water from outside of Kyoto at, um, at another, it's, I believe it's a sake brewery and they're taking it straight from a well there. Basically what that allows them to do is bypass any filtration that would be happening with the water source coming into Kyoto. Um, really that just is gonna give a lot more character to that water. And because water is the majority of what's in the bottle, like 50% more so, um, it's a big part of it and it's something that I always forget about how important water source is to spirits, but that's really a main component of what goes into these things other than the botanicals and the neutral grain that's in it. Um, like the Kamasa, this is actually made with a neutral grain distillate that is rice, which is also not that common, specifically in Western gins. Um, and the whole entity just becomes this very, very like citrus forward and bright and green gin that doesn't have as much of kind of a, a like whammy of juniper that I think a lot of people kind of attribute to most dry gins. So it can be a really good starting place for people. If you've got friends that are like, eh, I don't really do gin that much. It's, it's kind of hard not to find something to like about this stuff. Um, it mixes up really well. We'll get into that in a second with a couple of cocktails. Um, before I hop over to the Kamasa, are there any questions about this one? Okay. Believe me, chat, anybody out there in, in like the land, I will seriously monologue and just kind of like yammer away. So the more questions, the better. Otherwise it's just gonna be like, and you guys are all gonna fall asleep. Um, I will probably put myself to sleep. 
So um, the other gin that we have is from uh, Comasa Juzo, which is actually, it's their uh, heritage um, shochu brewery that's down in Kagoshima. So southern, southern part of the island. Um, they started up this product, I believe, in 2018. So a couple years after these guys launched. Again, it's that kind of like thing where they had the nice, like the starting point of Kinobi Distillery, just like really, really hitting a home run out of the gate. And now there's a little bit of that incentive to kind of like build on what Japanese spirits can be. They also opened uh, a whiskey distillery called Konosuke, which makes phenomenal whiskeys, but they wanted to also do a gin. So unlike this one, this is a very, very pared down gin. This is actually only three botanicals. So this is uh, Mikan. So a very, very small variety of Satsuma that actually grows right below a volcano and actually has to like, they individually have to like brush these things off to get like the volcanic ash off of them every season. Uh, juniper and coriander. So coriander and that Mikan fruit really, really bouncing off of each other with lots of citrus makes this gin just incredibly bright and really, really pop. Um, also something that's really cool about it, they are showing their pedigree as shochu makers and the base for this is actually, it's a rice shochu. So something that was previously fermented with koji and it has that slightly more like chewy kind of like, you know, heavier body to the distillate. And it really shows as being something incredibly unique. Um, we're gonna go through a couple, a couple things you can do with this, but I think I've, I've found a good home for it in the sour. It really makes sense. But um, they've got a couple other things coming up. They'll be doing, eventually, I believe we'll see um, a tea gin from them, as well as a strawberry gin, which I'm really excited to check out and just kind of seeing how that innovation is going to kind of keep running with spirits in Japan. Um, anybody got any questions right now? No, not, not right now. Wires are, are very, very quiet. All right, well, <laughs> let's get into making some drinks because that's actually kind of like, these things are great to have on their own. I actually do suggest both of these to just try them as they are and kind of get a feel for what they are. I think that's always a good thing to do before you start mixing with a spirit is really understand what that spirit is. And the more you kind of know what it tastes like before you mix with it, you'll have a starting point. You'll kind of understand where you ended up. Um, and then you can start to kind of walk the line back to where you want it to be. If maybe you went a little too far or not far enough uh, in terms of where the drink is. So I always think a really good thing just in any gin to do is really just start with martini um, because that kind of tells you a lot about what the gin is, how it mixes. It's two, maybe three ingredients max. And you're really not putting a whole lot of stuff in there to get in the way of what the actual distillate is. So um, usually when we're talking about martinis, we like if, especially behind the bar, like we talk about them in kind of ratios. Like if you're talking about kind of a classic martini proportion, you're talking about four to one, which is essentially four to one is just kind of counting in ounces, or I guess it would be half ounces. So uh, four would be two ounces of gin, and then one would be a half ounce of vermouth. Some people like it a lot drier than that. I tend to really like a little bit of vermouth in my martinis. I think it's kind of the point of having vermouth in the bottles, like you want to taste what that is. Um, just as a side note to anybody who doesn't do this already, if you have a vermouth, you open it up, immediately store it in the refrigerator because these things are essentially wines and they will spoil. So most people who really, really dislike vermouth is probably because they got a hold of some like nasty, like sat out way too long, oxidized vermouth that is not good drinking at all. Um, so today I figured we would do, well, we could do a couple things. We could do a four to one martini, which is really classic. So two ounces of gin and then a half ounce of vermouth. Um, I actually thought it would be kind of nice to do a split base martini and do two ounces of gin and then one ounce total of vermouth. And specifically with, this type of gin, I think that having a little bit of sweetness added with the vermouth is a really good thing, kind of in, like emphasizes some of the citrus notes in it. So I'm going to start with two ounces of Kinobi. Thank you. Uh, 
And then I'm going to do a half ounce of dry vermouth. Really, it doesn't matter too much what dry vermouth you use. I mean, it does and it doesn't, but just use what you like. It's at the end of the day, there's like, this is your drink. There's no wrong answers. Just do the thing you like. So I'm using a little bit of dry vermouth from Dolin. And then a little bit of Blanc Vermouth from Dolin as well. And basically Blanc Vermouth is, it's not a sweet vermouth where it's going to be that kind of like, obviously like deep red color, it's not that, but it's just, it's a slightly sweeter fortified wine. Whereas like a dry vermouth is gonna have a little bit more green, a little bit more kind of like peppery notes to it. This would be a little bit more citrusy and sweet. So I'm doing a half ounce of that, that's it. Sometimes I would chuck a couple dashes of orange bitters in this, but honestly, with uh, especially with Kino B, there's so much citrus in this already, it can get a little bit muddled with too many bitters. So we're just going to keep it light. So this is going to take a really long time for me to throw all of this ice in here. But I thought this would be a really elegant way to do it. Not so much. Turns out having a scoop is a great idea. Too American. Too American? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, all right. So now you've got this thing iced up. Also, when you're when you're stirring a martini, make sure that whether it's a pint glass, a tin, whatever it is, or a stirring vessel like this, really try to cover it with ice. Like make sure there's a lot of ice in this. Um, really, all you're gonna be doing is just making sure that it chills quickly. It's going to dilute, but it's not gonna dilute as fast as you would shake something. So I'm going to stir this for right around 30 seconds. Nobody time me. Also, something that's kind of a good thing to know if you, if like a lot of us, frankly, like if you're learning how to stir in a bar, stirring can be a real pain in the butt. It's actually like, it's a lot harder than shaking a drink. Um, I don't know if we have one here. We do. Something that makes stirring really easy is a chopstick. If you are finding that you're just like, like slamming your spoon all over the, the glass and you might break something, just use a chopstick. It's actually like the easiest thing ever just to stir with that. And it's gonna not create any friction and it'll just keep very, very simple. So I had a glass just kind of chilling over here. So I'm gonna dump out the water. Andrew asks, does ice cube size matter? Um, ice cube size does matter, um, except not, maybe not in a way that it's going to like break your drink. The most important thing is that if you're using um, what we kind of refer to as deli ice, which is like the stuff you just like get at the grocery store that comes in a bag, it's all different sizes, it's kind of chipped up. Um, because those are odd sizes of ice that are pretty thin, they're going to dilute a lot faster and melt a lot faster. So that means that you won't have to stir your drink for quite as long. It also means that you might, if you stir for a long time, you're definitely going to over dilute your drink, but that's really, it, it just means you have to do less work. Um, with things like this, you know, square kind of bar cubes, these things uh, don't have a lot of air in them. They're very, very dense and they're made to kind of be durable in a drink. So you can really control how long you're stirring something. Um, sometimes at the house, like if I don't have any ice, but I've, except for like one of those like king cube molds, I'll just take a couple of those big cubes and then just like literally like whack them a couple times with a non-elegant blunt object that I have around the house and then just chuck those in and stir with those. And that works great. Um, if you're not sure about if your drink is done or not, a really good thing to have on hand is just a straw and literally you can just check it as you go. And then when it's done, it's done. You're like, all right, well, that tastes good. That's it. Steven says, I almost always stir my drinks with a chopstick. That's funny. Yeah, it is it is kind of like the best hack ever. He also says he loves a gym martini. It's my gym weakness. Doesn't make me angry. It makes me very <laughs> relaxed. I was going to say, <laughs> I, I have not fought anybody on gin yet. Yeah. It's something with the juniper. I know it. Or I think it's just you. <laughs> Anyways, 
Uh, so with this, you know, obviously like we all have our preferences in terms of like how you like to have your martinis. I personally like them with a twist. Sometimes I feel very sassy and like them with a twist and olive. In this case, um, especially because Kino V has so much citrus in it, I'm going to just do a very, very small amount of uh, lemon and I'm going to express it over the drink just lightly and then just put a little on the side uh, just to get some Aramax. I'm going to get rid of it because I don't think it needs it. That's just good the way it is. I also have a friend who I work with back east who was horrified to find out that I like lots of lemon in my martinis and she basically wanted to disown me. So I'm going to try and not upset her with this and hopefully this passes the test. Anyways, so that's a two to one gin martini. In a beautiful glass. Found it in Mommy Mario. <laughs> um, somebody should probably have that now that oh, it's been yes. made. Let's see how pissed off I'll get. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so just since we talked about kind of proportions and martinis, um, two to one for that. As I said, like a four to one would be two parts of gin and then, you know, half ounce of, or pardon me, I should say two ounces of gin, half ounce of dry vermouth. Um, Kino B also makes a, uh, a Navy strength gin, which is basically just gin at a much higher proof, which is behind me, which is this guy. And so Navy strength gins are wonderful for uh, one to one martini. So whereas you would take equal parts gin and vermouth, which is, I know not maybe everybody's favorite because again, we've all been kind of conditioned to go like vermouth, not so much. Um, but it really is a lovely balancing act that happens because you have all this kind of like high test gin that's well over hundred proof. And then you kind of get to bring that down a little bit with a spirit that's not as strong. So it really does meet somewhere in the middle. And this is also classically called a 50, 50. So if you're ever like, please go to bars again, go, go to bars, um, go to a bar, order a 50, 50 and just ask if they have a Navy strength gin, ask if they have any of this Navy strength gin, cause it's delicious, but, um, it's a lovely way to drink gin and not, even though it sounds like it's going to be very strong, it's not going to totally like knock you out with strength. Step that you're okay. Yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit about why it's called Navy strength? Yeah, I mean, okay, look, there's, there are a couple different, uh, like, stories about, like, why it's called Navy Strength, um, you know, basically, you know, with, with naval ships, and obviously because of London Dry Gen being, you know, in the hub of everything, oh, God, I'm scared, she just took a sip, guys, this might be fighting time. Steven said, Yoko, don't let Kyoko drink that. <laughs> yeah, this, this might be game over, y'all. Um, <laughs> Like, where's my emergency contact? <laughs> um, so basically, the because you had a lot of gin that was going across in, uh, you know, with naval officers, you would have people consuming it with primarily with tonic water and lime, and that was really to scare off scurvy. Um, quinine uh, and citrus are really, really good combatants of that particular little bacteria. Um, and it was like, oh, okay, cool. I was like, I couldn't tell if that was, a, I don't want any more of that. Get it away from me. Uh, don't beat me up. Yeah. Anyway, it so. It needs the, a, a wedge of lemon, though. There you go. Thank you. Can we, we should tag Amanda Elder, who's actually the content and education manager for Skernick, and tell her this needs a lot more lemon. Okay. Uh, um, Steven, Steven says lemon in a martini is great. So he also concurs. Citrus on citrus, man. Um, but just, sorry, just to wrap this up really quickly. Essentially, yeah, if, it's a, if it's a Navy Strength gin, it's called Navy Strength because typically they would put it at a much higher proof to travel overseas. And the thought was, okay, if we, if we somehow splash our gin onto gunpowder, same thing with rum, they were typically like stored in similar quarters. If that gunpowder got wet with a spirit, that you would still be able to ignite it. And because of that, it needed to be at a higher proof. How much of this is true, I can't really prove, but I like that story because I just like to believe it's that people ridiculous. are really, really considering like, <laughs> ah, shit, we might actually like really need this to be stronger so we can light stuff on fire and other by fire, I mean other people. Um, so that's kind of, that's how I would build a martini in this circumstance. I think um, other drinks that are really, really good with these types of things, it, 
talking about drinks with a home bartender and specifically with gins like this, less is more. Like it's, it's great if you want to like really like go in and experiment, try this in like a last word with some chartreuse, with some maraschino, like those are wonderful things. Try the Pebu Club, that's a great old classic cocktail. Um, I'm happy to kind of like go down that rabbit hole and let people know how to do those things. But I think it's always good to kind of know the thingness of the thing and know how it is by itself and then know how it is in a very, very elegant drink that just doesn't have a lot of interference. Um, so to that, let's say we'd go to our second drink, which actually, how are we doing on time, guys? 6.10, we're good. All right, cool. So um, Komasa is a lovely, lovely gin that I, I, I personally just drink this by itself, like on the rocks. Um, it kind of has this really lovely, like citrus, almost too high vibe to it that I think is just kind of doesn't need a whole lot of anything attached to it. Um, but in kind of doing some experiments and figuring out like what would be best with this, I think it's like, it's really lovely with soda. Um, I really wanted to, to say like tonic is going to be the thing that's going to just like elevate this to a different place and really tonic the bitterness of tonic can really like tamp down on the expressiveness and how aromatic this gin is, which is really what makes it so special. So just kind of figured, well, like it's something that people don't drink a whole lot these days because it's, I actually don't know why people don't drink Collins, but a Collins is a fantastic drink. So doing a gin Collins with Kamasa is really killer. So um, a Collins is really simple. It's basically just a gin sour with some soda water and that's it. It's not rocket science at all. So um, we're going to start with an ounce and a half of the Kamasa. Do you have a preference on lemon type, like Meyer or Eureka? Do you like the more sourness from a Eureka? I'd say Eureka lemons are probably your best bet for sure. Meyers, I think Meyers can be great in drinks, but Meyers are, they're sweet and tart. Um, and so when you're adding more aromatics, especially with gin, and you're adding a little like some sweetness to it, those are a couple of variables that you may not get the same results. And I think, I don't know, maybe it's just because growing up in Northern California, but like yeah. Meyer lemons are bloody everywhere and everybody boring. loves Meyer lemons and everything. So, and I love them too. I think Meyer lemons are great, but I think in an application like this, it can be a little much. Um, so uh, anyways, we've got our gin um, and then I'm gonna put it in uh, some lemon juice I squeezed earlier. And um, also something that's, this might be a little bit geeky, so I apologize, guys, but it is something to think about. Um, lemons and limes, citrus of all types, can be wildly different from fruit to fruit. And sometimes you'll make a drink and you just squeeze like fresh, fresh squeeze, like lemon juice or lime juice, and it'll just be like bracingly bitter and bracingly tart. Um, sometimes doing that ahead of time, like if you're planning for a cocktail party or just like you have some friends coming over, juice like juice earlier in the day just get out of the way and don't think about it and just like have a little on the side like four ounces or something for whatever you're going to make because as oxygen kind of works with that juice some of those more like volatile acids are going to mellow out and it's not going to be as bracing which can be really helpful so like a lot of times you know in bars we, you know, we have prep people that choose prior to the shift. So juice will always taste a little bit different. So oh, there's that. Oh, you had prep people do that for you. That was me. <laughs> That's what being a bar manager is. <laughs> um, yeah. And every once in a while, I get really spoiled. Um, JC, so, wait, JC asked how much lemon juice. Can you go over that again? Is I'm so sorry. It was three quarters of an ounce. So a really uh, kind of classic sour spec is if you're doing uh, one and a half ounces of spirit, three quarter ounce of citrus and a half ounce of sweetener. Um, in this case, it's a half ounce of sweetener, but this, the simple syrup that I used is two parts of sugar to one part of water. So effectively you're just making a much more rich syrup. Um, what that does is you just give the drink less water mass and it gives it a little bit more texture, which can be really beneficial. Um, so this is actually literally like not fancy sugar. This is CNA sugar. And there's a reason for that. It's this stuff is, um, flavor neutral. Like when you're thinking about like sugar, like it's just sweet. Um, when you're talking about like sugar in the raw, just like unrefined sugar, there's a real, like 
earthiness to it, sometimes like a little molasses edge. And that stuff can be wonderful in drinks. That's usually what I use in bars. But for something like this, where especially with this gin, it's so clean and so defined. I didn't want a lot of other flavors kind of like mixing in with that. So we just went with good old plain white sugar. So this is a half ounce of two to one sugar. And then usually like I'll have a straw around somewhere, but I'm gonna just taste a little bit of this and make sure that it's not total poison. It's kind of where I want it to be. And it doesn't suck. So that's good. Um, and my ice is melted. So you're gonna have to excuse me for a second because I gotta do a quick refill. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Um, all right, so I got to grab a little bit more ice in one second, but this is a good moment to pause and just kind of talk about like before you're shaking a drink. Um, just back to that question about like, does ice matter? Does the size of the ice matter? Especially when you're talking about shaking cocktails, the size of the ice does matter because the action of shaking a drink is supposed to be a lot more violent than stirring a drink. Stirring a drink, you should not really be like your spoon or chopstick or whatever it is should not be going above or submerging multiple times like across the surface of the drink. It should be just kind of like smooth motion. You shouldn't hear like a lot of banging around, anything like that. But that means that it's going to be a little bit more labor intensive and take more time. Obviously with shaking a drink, you really got to wake the thing up. It's like, it's, we always kind of talk about shaking a drink is really like making the drink come alive. It's supposed to like have some action. And that's because you really want to mix air into it, which is the opposite of a stirred drink. You don't want a lot of air in a stirred drink. Um, and that's simply a textural thing. So for this, if you're using deli ice, you really want to make sure that you don't overshake it because it's just going to co completely dilute really quickly. So I'd say if you have uh, like just bagged ice like that, shake a, um, a drink that's going to go over soda water, like, or like tall on ice. Don't shake it for much more than like four seconds. And literally like shake, like one, two, three, four, done. Like just call it. Because you're gonna put that drink over more ice that's gonna dilute, and then you're gonna add soda water to that, and that's gonna dilute it further. So you're just kind of letting your other ingredients do the work for you basically. Um, with the ice that we have on hand, I'm going to shake it a little harder and a little longer because, again, these are slightly more robust cubes. So I'm going to go for like a full six seconds. So you would definitely not recommend, though, that you shake the lemon juice and the gin. You can't just build it in the glass and stir it around a little bit? Absolutely could if you want to. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think this is like, again, especially if you're doing this at your house, like as long as you have the proportions right, it's your drink. Like you should be able to do kind of like what makes sense to you. Um, shaking it, all it's really gonna do is it's going to create a slightly like lighter texture and it's going to be a colder drink, which is always helpful. All right, so something that I usually do just as a point of, point of habit, you guys don't have to do this, you can do it after the fact, but I've got soda water that I'm gonna to add to this, which is I'm gonna put two ounces of soda in this glass. Um, I like to add it first and just get it out of the way. Some people uh, like to add it directly to the tin and just strain it in. Some people like to top it. Honestly, like if it's at a bar for guests, I've got opinions galore. If it's at your house, just do what you like. Just <laughs> do the thing and just enjoy it and know that you made something for yourself. So I'm just going to double strain this over the rocks. And then chuck a little garnish on this. Um, again, our friend the lemon comes back into play. This time, I'm not gonna be shy about it. This is like good to have plenty of citrus on. So I'm gonna go pretty thick on this guy. So um, I usually will peel citrus over the drink. That way any air, like oils that jump off of it will go over the top of the drink. 
Same for the orange. I'll just give a little squeeze. You can lay them on top of one another and just twist them together. And in the drink it goes. And then you've got your Jim Collins. So, yeah. Um, does anybody have questions about either of the drinks or other drinks that you guys are interested in making with these gins or kind of how they play in cocktails? Stephen did have a question really quick before he has to go. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, do, you, do you know if Skernik plans to in, import any of the other Comasa gins? You know, they've got like a green tea one and they just launched a strawberry one, I think. We're, um, I know we're going to get the strawberry one. I'm not, I think we'll get the, the Hojicha one as well. Oh, cool. I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, I've been talking with, these are actually brought in by our friends over at Hybrid Spirits. Um, so they're the importers to the United States. So I've got to talk with those guys and see when they're going to be coming out. But I'm hoping, hoping, fingers crossed, by, um, by like fall winter. Oh, fantastic. Um, he said that Collins looks great, and it does. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. What are, what is everybody, is everybody making the drinks at home as well, or what are you enjoying? Any opinions <laughs> about the gins? I personally also, as an aside, I forgot to, um, mention it but uh i love i think we all love the kenobi green tea gin which is just excellent it's astoundingly good which is also behind you there so this gin is actually they um they pare down the botanicals in this significantly so it's not going to be those 11 botanicals but what they do is they add a secondary green tea so they add a little bit of tensha to this and that really makes it's like it just basically makes it like a matcha bomb. It just tastes like matcha gin. It's one of the most amazing things I've had. Um, and interestingly enough, really makes one of my favorite gin and tonics. Um, having some of the bitterness from the gin interact with the, like, the idea of tannin you have in green tea really just ramps it all up and just makes it just like this incredibly complex and really beautiful drink. So I definitely recommend that. Um, yeah, really surprising amount of like savoriness and umami. Yeah, it's I, amazing. There's like, I think we all, when we were tasting it here, we all got like a really, really good amount of like salinity. And I think, you know, I think kombu got brought up a couple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really, really cool stuff. It's, yeah. it's definitely one of my favorite things to mess around with. Um, Rob says that uh, he's enjoying both of the uh, the Collins and the Martini. Um, one of them loves the Martini, and the other loves the Collins. Perfect. So yeah, they're but yeah, it's always one one always loves the stirred, and the other loves the, loves the drinks. <laughs> Neighbors are over. He says, "Oh, that's awesome." <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm more of a stirred person. Uh, definitely my husband loves the, the citrus drinks, so I always have to make both. And work wife likes the, the <laughs> shaken. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so good. It's sour. Oh, yeah. good. I'm glad you like it. Thank you. Yeah, it's so good. I prefer the martini. It's just so good. It just needs some some olive juice. I, I'm just, seriously, guys, I'm waiting to, like, you know, the, <laughs> the camera's going to cut. It's going to come back on, and, it's gonna like, be like Boom. yeah, we're all going to have black eyes. <laughs> Rob says, um, I'm sorry if, if your name is Rob or R Robert, um, is it okay to make two martinis at the same time or no, no? Uh, I mean, to me, like, I, I think it's totally fine. And again, this is like, I think that like bar rules and home rules are completely different. Um, I think as long as if you're going to make two martinis at the same time, just make sure you have enough room in the vessel. So like, if you're doing that, like you can build two drinks in this. It's going to be really topped off. It's going to be very full, but you'll still be able to get the dilution right. I think if you were doing it in something smaller than this, I would say maybe not a great idea just because it's you'll end up spilling a lot of stuff and it's going to be way more trouble than it's worth. Um, but I mean, I think as long as you are aware of the ice you're putting in and then 
just how long you're stirring it, it's going to be totally fine. It's like you you really cannot break drinks. It's easiest thing in the world. Well, I mean, let's talk about dilution for a second, though, for either even shaken or stirred. Yeah. Do you double the time that you're stirring or shaking? Or is it, you know, do you, is it kind of a fraction? And then I find that if you double the time and just don't check, like you, you will inevitably over dilute yeah. the thing. Right. Because really what that depends on is how much ice is in the container. Um, I will, I will kind of still use my, my little like, you know, cliff notes of like what my time is and say like, all right, well, it's two cocktails. Like maybe I'll start it for like 40 seconds. Right. Well, what's your usual? Yeah, it's like, tw I mean, it depends. Like, uh, I, I go around like 25 to 30 seconds. If it's like oh, nice, like, okay. you know, okay. dry, thick ice. Um, and I know for some people that might be a little bit too long for some people mm, that might be not long enough, actually. Right. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's important, like, if you're not sure about how a drink is supposed to taste, you make one, you see if you like it or not, and then maybe the next time you make it, you just try and, like, if it tasted, like, a little too strong, just start for five, five more seconds and just see if it works. But again, like, that's kind of the great thing about stirring. That's, um, it's much easier in some ways to check your work against shaking, is that if you have a straw, you can just kind of, like, stir, 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 check. You know, mm -hmm. it's like every like five, five, 10 seconds, mm -hmm. like just give it a, give it a check and see if it tastes right. And if you're like, Ooh, still too strong, then, you know, you can go a little longer and then, you know, you might go a little too long and go, all right, well, I know I have to dial that back now. Um, when you're shaking something that that's the tricky thing is like, that's actually, you know, a lot of my friends in bars will tell me that I'm way too uh, fussy about this. And they're totally right, but I I would typically not shake two drinks in one ten, um, partially because you can't check your work. Um, also, partially because if you do go a little bit too long on something, and you just like weren't paying attention, or something went wrong, or you realize you missed an ingredient, you haven't just messed up two drinks. You messed up or ah uh, one drink. It's two now. I, I swear to God, I can count, guys. Um, but. You know, again, like if you're at your home, it's fine. Mm -hmm. It's fine, especially like if you're if you're making stuff for friends. It it always just depends. Like I know, like for myself, if I'm at the house and I'm making a gin and tonic, and I've got a friend over, I will always jigger pour my tonic water because I want to make sure that my ratios are right. And like, that's not that may not seem quite so casual. That's like okay, now you're like trying to put a proportion into just making a simple highball. Um, but if it's just me and it's yet at the end of the day and I just want to drink, I'm like, I'm not jigger boring anything. I'm going to eyeball that and it's going to be fine. And really it's just kind of about the mood and like how you feel about the thing. Um, to that, you know, if you're talking about like a gin and tonic, I usually err on the side of like dropping the proportion on the gin a little bit and going with like maybe an ounce and a half to like four to four and a half ounces of tonic. Jigger pour that and see if it tastes right to you. But I always like gin and tonics to not be a punch in the face. Mm -hmm. and like, I want to have a couple of those, which may not be the greatest idea in hindsight, instead of just one. But, you know, the first one, I don't want to just like go completely flat out and like have a really strong cocktail. Right. I made a Pegu club the other night with the uh, Komasa gin here, and it was really delicious, but definitely uh, it was too tight. You know, I tend to shake. Um, I don't, I tend to not shake for long enough. So it's, you know, it's hard. Making cocktails is really, really difficult. Um, the dilution is such a key point. <laughs> we're, we're trying to pump people up. It's not yeah, difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it is, you know, but it, it really like makes or break, it breaks it because when it's um, under shaken, you know, it's way too uh, spirit forward. If it's over shaken, it's just diluted and it's just watery. So you know, it, it does take some time to get it, to get it right. You know, if you, if, especially at, at your own house, you'll get the hang of um, your ice, right. And like how your ice acts yeah, for and sure. how much, you know, dilution will come out of your ice. So it's, it's at least when you're home, you get to know your ice good, well. You know? And I would say also for anybody who is trying to make a lot of drinks at home and you're worried about like, if you have the right ice or whatever, um, just a couple of things to keep in mind. If you're, if you're using ice from your freezer and that is, you don't have like an ice machine as part of your refrigerator, or you don't have like a bag of ice, but it's just like frozen in trays. 
don't keep any contaminants in the freezer because they will leach into the ice. So like if you have like frozen chicken sitting next to it, that's like in a thin bag or a thin coating, that flavor will kind of like get mm -hmm. sucked out through the membrane and will go into the ice. Ice is one of those funny things where it almost acts like uh, it's a bit of a flavor magnet. So um, just try and keep as clean an environment as you can. Um, I just literally put like, I mean, it's stupid because it takes up my entire freezer, but I basically put like a little igloo cooler in my freezer and just put my ice in that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, all of the keeping all the contaminants out. Like, keep it clean. Yeah. Um, See out of my ice. But really, like, at the end of the day, with any sort of mixing like this, like these are, like, a martini is very simple, and just like many things, um, the devil's in the details, right? So it's like you can. That's kind of the thing that's fascinating about drinks like this is they're as simple as it gets, but you can kind of make them as complicated as you want to, because if you keep thinking about the quality of your ice, how long you're stirring, if your drinkware is cold, if your jigger work was proper, like if you've got the right measurement, if you didn't like go too far below or you spilled a bunch of you know gin in there that didn't need to be a part of the recipe, you start to kind of compound all these little variables. And that's, to me, that's what makes you know the actual craft of making a drink really fascinating. And then obviously being able to talk to everybody about it and hopefully not make it seem so terrifying because it should be fun at the end of the day. It's like drink should be fun, gin is fun. We do these things for pleasure and we do them because we want to share with, with others. Um, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Rob says, says totally on the home ice. He agrees. Or should we go in? Oh, yeah, and come by. I drank all the martini. Oops. Uh -oh. uh, I need to, here, I need to okay. uh -oh. chug water. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Uh -oh. It's not, it's no, okay. There's a tiny little, yeah, there's a tiny bit of uh, salt. Nice. I'm not cheers oh, with water, okay, guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Come Cheers. Come Cheers. Come Cheers. Come Cheers. Come Thank you so much, yeah. Chris. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. And you too, Ian. Oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> Thank and thanks you. everybody thanks, for guys. joining. Appreciate it. Um, we hope to do more spirits events in person soon as well. So hope you can make it. Hope to see you soon. Thank That's you. Soon. Next one in person. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Thank God. We Thank just got you. our ice machine back up too. So. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.